If you have ever communicated with a member or speaker from the John Birch Society, you may have noticed something strange that is kind of hard to put into words. They all seem to spew out the same talking points, and it has been my experience that no matter how much evidence you provide them, they are so brainwashed by their organization against an Article 5 convention that they just won't listen to any or, or even process the truth. Kind of sounds like a religious cult, doesn't it? Well, as the saying goes, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, you know the rest. Don't go away. As we're about to peel back some of the layers of the John Birch Society like you've never seen before. Welcome to All Things Article 5, where we do a deep dive into the Constitution's amending provision to break through all of the misinformation out there to get to the truth. Whether you are an Article 5 activist like myself or kind of new to this subject and want to learn more, this is the place to be. Now, if you're a legislator getting bombarded with emails against for this process, please like this channel, save it to your favorites because a lot of the information is really kind of tailored to you. I guarantee you will not want to miss an episode. So please subscribe to the channel and check this out because a lot of the emails you get, I'm going to provide you the answers to. So sit back and join me as we learn from the past, get engaged in the present in order to change the future. If you are confused about the subject of an Article 5 convention because you have friends that are completely against it, claiming it will rewrite the Constitution, and also friends fighting hard to call a convention to have amendments proposed, and feel like you're caught in the middle, that's okay. I've been there myself. This is why I'm doing these videos. We're going to break through all that, so I just, wanna, I just want you to stay with us because it's well worth your time. The founder of the John Birch Society, Robert Welch, kicked off his organization with a two-day presentation in Indianapolis reading his book titled The Blue Book to the 11 men that attended those two days. The Blue Book provides a very good insight into the organization and its goals and how the society would operate. What really caught my attention was how the structure of the organization operates similar to a religion. Here are a few quotes from the article by the American Psychological Association titled, Cults of Hatred. I want you to pay particular attention to this definition because I think it's going to be kind of surprising. Quote, cults often use behavior modification on followers, such as thought-stopping techniques and instilling an us-versus-them mindset. Phobia indoctrination is also used where cults play on a person's irrational fears. Hmm. Maybe like a runaway convention to rewrite the Constitution, perhaps? Continuing, quote, a destructive cult is an authoritarian regime which uses deception when recruiting as well as mind control techniques to make a person dependent and obedient, unquote. Now, that seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? But I think you're going to be very surprised when you see some of the information from the Blue Book. Now, from the Christian Research Institution, what is a cult? Uh, here's the definition there. Quote, there are two ways to define a cult. The first way to describe a cult is popular in the secular media. From this perspective, a cult is a religious or semi-religious sect whose members are controlled almost entirely by a single individual or by an organization. In combating cult mind control, the programmer Stephen Hassan singles out what he refers to as destructive cults, which he defines as, quote, a pyramid-shaped authoritarian regime with a person or group of people that have dictatorial control. Hassan developed the BITE, B-I-T-E acronym, which describes the components employed by destructive cults using the mind control. BITE covers the following areas of control. Information control. Cult leaders deliberately withhold or distort information, lie, propagandize, 
and limit access to other resources of information. Thought control. Cult leaders use loaded words and language. Discourage critical thinking. Bar any speech critical of cult leaders or policies. And teach an, quote, us versus them, unquote, doctrine. Emotional control. Leaders manipulate their followers via fear, guilt, and indoctr indoctrination. Now, I bet you're asking yourself right now, what in the world does any of this have to do with an Article 5 convention? I'm glad you asked. I want to play for you some segments of Robert Welch reading from his blue book, and I think you will find it very, very interesting. The John Birch Society will operate under completely authoritative control at all levels. The fear of tyrannical oppression of individuals and other arguments against the authoritative structure in the form of governments have little bearing on the case of a voluntary association where the authoritative power can be exercised and enforced only by persuasion. The men who joined the John Birch Society during the next few months or few years are going to be doing so primarily because they believe in me and what I am doing and are willing to accept my leadership anyway. And we are going to use that loyalty, like every other resource, to the fullest possible advantage that we can. Whenever and wherever, either through infiltration by the enemy or honest differences of opinion, that loyalty ceases to be sufficient to keep some fragment in line, we are not going to be in the position of having the society's work weakened by raging debates. We are not going to have factions develop on the two sides to every question theme. Those members who cease to feel the necessary degree of loyalty can either resign or will be put out before they build up any splintering following of their own inside the society. We shall encourage proselyting at all levels for new members of both our local chapters and our home chapter. And we must gain both moral and financial support steadily, or we shall not be in position to do the things that have to be done as fast as we need to do them. For, as I have said, we are not kidding or just talking, and we do mean business every step of the way. As I see it, I'm afraid you have just two alternatives. Either you and tens of thousands like you come into the John Birch Society and, without giving it the whole of your lives, still devote to its purposes the best and most you can offer with money and head and heart as well as hands. Or in a very few years, you will by force be devoting all to the maintenance of a communist slave state. So we are asking for a lot. We want you to know it. If and when you sign an application blank for membership in the John Birch Society. That brings us next to a consideration as to the very nature of our undertaking, which needs to be made clear. For all revolutions, as Metternich once pointed out, begin in the best minds and work downward. While most religions begin at the bottom with the masses and gradually acquire both respectability and acceptance at the top, we are neither and both. Yet the evangelical fervor with which we expect our members to fight the forces of evil and work for a better world makes certain principles with regard to religious groups apply to ourselves. Who's going to die for the XYZ Association or the Blank Committee? We are fast coming to a point, gentlemen, where we've got to offer something that people are willing to die for. And only over long periods of time, and then in rare instances, do we generate and maintain loyalty for an organization that is even in the same league with loyalty for an individual. The nature of those truths and the tenets of this faith, which I hope and believe every man in this room can accept and approve, I shall come to later this morning. What I'm trying to do here as an introduction to and part of our thinking about how to rid America of the collectivist cancer is simply this. I want to convince you, as I am convinced, that only dynamic personal leadership offers any chance for us to save either our material or our spiritual inheritance. I want to convince you, as I am convinced, that even under such leadership, we have no chance unless the specific battles are fought as part of a larger and more lasting movement to restore once again an upward reach 
to the heart of man. And I have wished to make clear what you were bound to be assuming already, that with whatever I have in me of faith, dedication, and energy, I intend to offer that leadership to all who are willing to help me. Two, that there was not going to be any such movement without the dynamic overall personal leadership to which I have also been referring. And three, that with all of my own shortcomings, there wasn't anybody else on the horizon willing to give their whole lives to the job with the determination and dedication I would put into it if I didn't. To one of the basic purposes for which this meeting was called. It is one which I approach with great humility, but with no misgivings as to its necessity. For we simply are not going to be able to save our country from either the immediate threat of communism or the long-range threat of socialism by organizational leadership. Our only possible chance is dynamic personal leadership. Welch obviously had some kind of messiah complex, and when you take his quotes and review their materials, we start to see, number one, Welch claimed JBS was a revolution and a religion. Number two, he pointed himself as the leader and savior of the nation. Three, he stated that JBS will operate under, quote, completely authoritative control at all levels, unquote. Four, there would be no disagreeing with Welch within the society. Five, full loyalty was demanded or either resign or get kicked out. And six, Welch's speeches are seen as prophetic. The cult of the John Birch Society. Let me just lay this out for you, and I'm going to leave this for you to decide. Number one, they have their founder and prophet, Robert Welch. Number two, they have their own Bible, the Blue Book. Number three, they have a moral code of 20 resolutions to live by called the JBS Resolutions. Now, there is nothing wrong with expecting members to behave morally. That's a good thing. Apparently, their resolution number two, which says this, I shall always be truthful, <laughs> I think they need to revisit that one. Number four, they have their own dictionary to define words and terms used by JBS members. Number five, they have their own monthly meeting agendas determine, uh, to determine their uh, calls to action. I hope by now you see what we're dealing with here. This is not your typical group that disagrees with a policy. This is a political religious cult that demands complete loyalty of its members. Understanding this does help to explain why JBS members are so completely controlled by their society and they're actually unable to critically think about this issue. Now, recently I presented my new presentation titled, quote, Debunking the Myths Against an Article 5 Convention, unquote. That's the title of my presentation, where I presented all this research. And at the end of my presentation, a woman said, you saved me. <laughs> I asked her, what did she mean by that? And she said, I was planning to attend a JBS meeting the following week. And knowing the information that you shared, I definitely will not attend. That's a good thing. Now, in his book, 20 Ways uh, That Cults Misread the Bible by James Sire, he provides some examples of how cults twist the scriptures to teach something that's not even true. I think you'll find this interesting. Here are the tactics from Sire's book that I have found JBS most often uses. Inaccurate quotations, twisted translation, ignoring the immediate context, Collapsing context, wordplay, saying but not citing, selective citing, inadequate evidence, ignoring alternative explanations. In upcoming episodes, you will see and hear members of the JBS cult employing these tactics. And once you do, I think you will begin to understand the motive behind them. Now, please understand, I have no problem with people today disagreeing on whether an amendment to the Constitution is a good idea or not. Let's have that discussion on the merits of the actual amendment itself. 
what I do have a problem with is people like Robert Brown and JBS dishonoring the framers of our Constitution and taking their words out of context to teach something completely opposite of what they believed. This is the reason they need to be called out and exposed. You are not going to believe the lengths that these people go to to deceive to make you afraid of the Constitution's amending provision. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. With all things Article 5, I'm Ken Quinn. Remember, experience must be our only guide. Fear will paralyze us. So fear not. Let's have some fun, and the truth will prevail. Till next time.